Hello and welcome to a very special episode of To The Point. My guest today is the departing American Ambassador Richard Varma. In 36 hours, Mr. Varma will step down as the American Ambassador, but he's agreed today to talk about his two years in India, his successes as well as the unfinished tasks, the journey that lies ahead, the challenges, and how he views the state of the relationship between the two countries as he steps down as Ambassador. This is Ambassador Varma's first and only farewell interview on television. Ambassador, let's start with yourself. You're just finishing two years as the American ambassador in India. How do you look back on that experience? Yeah, well, Karen, first of all, uh, welcome back to Roosevelt House because uh, I think back it was two years ago that you came here right after President Obama's visit here uh, when he was the chief guest of Republic Day. And uh, when I look back on these 24, 25 months, I think that we may have had two of the best years we've ever had in the U.S.-India relationship. And the credit goes to President Obama and Prime Minister Modi, but also to all those people that have worked on the relationship for a long time. And we've made such incredible progress. And I, I say the relationship is on a solid upward trajectory. Personally, uh, I've had the great privilege to travel all over India, 29 states, uh, in 25 months, which uh, has been so fulfilling, learned so much. but. When I look at the major areas of our cooperation in defense, in trade, Can in energy... Can I stop you before sure. I come to them and yeah. ask you one more question about yourself? Absolutely. And then I will come to your successes. Sure. You were the first American ambassador who's been of Indian origin. Yeah. Did that make it easier or at times was it a bit awkward for you as well? I, I didn't... Well, I never thought it was awkward. And it's been an enormous uh, sense of pride for me particularly because uh, I was able to travel back uh, to Jalandhar in Punjab where my grandmother and mother were raised. I went to DAV College where my father went to school. Those must have been really special moments. Well, they were incredible because I saw it wasn't that long ago, wasn't that long ago that our country, that our family was here in this country uh, surviving every day like everyone else, uncertain of what their future might hold. But I also saw the impact that they had in their communities. I went to the government girls' school that my grandmother taught at across from a, a slum area in, in Jalandhar. I went to where my father grew up. I went to the flat where my grandmother lived. When I was a kid, I went and stayed with her. We had no running water inside. We had one TV on the, on the block. Uh, we had no refrigerator. We had no stove other than an uh, open fire pit in the kitchen. Those were my memories. Now to come back 50 years later in this capacity to represent the United States, to represent the president, I know what a long shot that is. I know also it's a, it's a classic immigrant story and I'm, I'm so proud of that. I also know I didn't get here on my own. I got here, well, I asked my dad, I said, why did you leave India in 1963? You didn't have to go. He said, I, I left because of you. I wanted you to have more opportunities. I wanted you to have a better future. And they worked so hard there, and they worked so hard here in India. And so for me to be able to come back and try to do something to help this relationship and to help people in both our countries, what an incredible honor. Let's then talk about the job you've done for the last two years. There's no doubt that the relationship between the two countries has improved very considerably under President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. And a lot of that because of the fact that two men had a very strong personal rapport. Right. How would you describe the state of the relationship as you stepped down as ambassador? Yeah, it's as strong as it's ever been. Uh, you know, over our history, the relationship has been on a series of ups and downs and roller coasters. But we are now on a solid upward tra trajectory. Uh, I think the, the gains that we've achieved in all the key areas are irreversible and we have uh, a new trust in our relationship that we didn't have before. You know, the Prime Minister said to the Congress when he was there last summer, he said, we've overcome the hesitations of history. You know, for a long time, this relationship was caught up in our own respective histories, which, which prevented us from getting closer, which I understand. But I think the Prime Minister said it exactly right. We have overcome those hesitations of history. We now see the huge advantages to both of our countries by being closer. And I'm, and I'm happy to go through the different areas of what we've actually done because I think you have to get beyond the rhetoric 
and into the actual substance, especially in an era where people doubt the benefits of globalization. I want very much to get into that, and I'm going to begin by asking you about what you consider your key successes, yeah. and then I'm going to ask you about areas where perhaps the task has been left unfinished. Sure. To begin with, what would you say were your key successes? Yeah, look, I think I'd start just in our government-to-government -government, uh, interaction. Our leaders have met nine times. We've had three summits. We have 100 new initiatives, 40 different government-to-government uh, -government working groups that are not only celebrating successes but solving problems. So the way in which we interact with each other has deepened uh, and built trust in key areas. Secondly, in our strategic and defense cooperation, we, you know, we now uh, talk about supporting India's global rise and its aspirations to be a global power. We talk about it that in a way we haven't before, and we don't just talk about it, we back it up. So we've designated India as a major defense partner, something no other country has with the United States. We've increased the complexity of our military exercises. We've topped $15 billion in defense sales, and we are now moved well beyond buyer-seller, talking about building together the most advanced and sophisticated military equipment right here in India. And that's a big change. We've also signed on to a notion of cooperation across the Asia Pacific. So our joint vision statement from January of 2015 for cooperation across the Asia Pacific talks about supporting the rule of law, economic integration, the peaceful resolution of disputes. When those basic notions are under threat across the world, for the US and India to come together like we have it, it solidified our strategic convergence. So that's just strategic and defense. Stop there. We'll come to the others in a moment's time. Within strategic and defense, sure. with great fanfare, you launched what was called the Defense Trade and Technology sure. Initiative. Yeah. Chuck Hagel, who was Defense Secretary at the time, called it the opening of a new chapter. Right. Many today look back two years later and say, if a new chapter did open, not too many pages have turned. Has the DTTI lived up to your expectations? Sure. Well, they, they may not have been reading the same book that I've been reading because a lot of pages have been turned. Uh, six new DTTI working groups, four new Pathfinder projects, everything from new chemical, biological weapons detections to advanced uh, bio-warfare gear for our soldiers, we just announced two new possible projects, an advanced uh, vertical lift, a new helicopter, a new ground combat vehicle. We're exploring both of those possibilities. We have had advanced discussions in carrier cooperation, in jet fighter technology. We have a special cell in the Pentagon that just deals with India and technology transfer. And as I said, the major defense partner status is directly connected to DTTI because it talks about treating India as if it was the closest ally for the purposes of technology transfer. So DTTI, not only unique to India, a huge success. Secretary Carter, Secretary Hagel, others, huge uh, proponents of it. Now, as we speak, American companies are keen to try and sell the production line of either the F-16 or the F-18 to India as part of Mr. Modi's Made in India initiative. That's obviously something for the future, but do you think it will actually happen or do you think it will probably fall by the wayside? Oh, look, I think we're, we're very excited about the potential, uh, again, not only in fighters, but in carriers, in other advanced uh, military equipment. To co the whole concept of DTTI is about co-producing, co-developing, and not only just for our militaries, but for export to third countries. So it actually aligns quite well with where we're going. So you expect the F-16 or the F-18 production line to eventually be sold and for manufacturers to start in India? I think, uh, look, this is going to be a competition. It's not just going to be gifted to us. So we're going to have to compete for it. And in this new era, we're going to have to demonstrate the value to Indian uh, voters and Indian uh, workers and to American uh, workers as well because it must have a benefit to both our countries. I can make that case quite strongly that it will have a benefit. Now, something that the two countries did sign last year was LAMOA. Right. It's one of the foundation agreements that permits each country to use the facilities of the other yeah. for supplies and repairs. But has LAMOA actually been used at all, or is that still waiting to happen? So you remember, we, we just finalized uh, LAMOA last fall. So LAMOA, um, you know, we talk about all the exercises we do together, and one of the great pleasures of this job is I've gone and seen the Air Force exercise, I've seen the Special Forces exercise, the Army exercise.
our militaries are great together. And Lamoa is simply an agreement that allows the food, the fuel, the housing. But has it been used, Ambassador? Has it, an American ship come or has an Indian ship gone to America? It, it will be used. And all it does is it streamlines our cooperation in a way that makes sense for two countries that have come together in this way. So the strategic and defense cooperation has, has really, I think, exceeded expectations. But we didn't even uh, get to but, yet but the... While we're sure. on the strategic relationship, there are still the two further foundational agreements best known by their short form, SISMOA and BICA. Yeah. Now there it's no great secret that the Indians have a certain reservation, they view these as possibly a bit more intrusive and so they're not that keen to follow through. Do you think you've succeeded in whittling down Indian reservations? I think so. Look, I, I heard the same objections to Lamoa uh, when I started here. And these agreements at the end of the day are for the benefit of our two militaries. They're not about compromising anyone's sovereignty or giving anyone basing rights. It's as two militaries cooperate more together, how do we make it easier so that we're out at sea, we can help each other, so that if we have an emergency, we can help each other, so that if we have routine exercises, we can help each other without having a new agreement every so time we work. So you expect SISMO and BICA to be signed in think, the foreseeable future? I think what I expect is to ha continue to have good discussions on them, and we'll go as as the Secretary of Defense likes to say, we'll go as far and as fast as our two governments want to go. Which means as far and as fast as the Indians want to go, because they are the ones that are slightly holding back. Well, look, I think as we're talking about more sophisticated cooperation, advanced uh, generation technologies, these agreements will make more sense. Ambassador Barba, we've talked about the defense and strategic relationship very exhaustively. Briefly, what are the other two key successes you're proud of? Yeah, let me mention the clean energy and climate change work and also our general work on improving our economics and trade relationship. So in clean energy and, and climate change, obviously the Paris Climate Agreement stands up as one of the signature global agreements we were able to achieve. If you were to ask President Obama today how we achieved Paris, it is, he would say it was because of the leadership of the Indian Prime Minister bringing on a number of countries and his work together closely with Prime Minister Modi. That was a breakthrough. No one thought it was possible to have the U.S. and India come together the way they did. Also in this area uh, was our breakthrough on civil nuclear cooperation. And that was a breakthrough because we got past the liability issue. Uh, what we did we? I'm going to stop you there because it's very interesting you should call it a breakthrough. President Obama called it a historic breakthrough. Absolutely. But at the very same time, and you'll remember this, the New York Times said it was vague and inconclusive. Right. And now two years down the road, American companies really haven't taken meaningful steps to set up a nuclear plant in India. What's holding it up? Well, let me tell you what's happened in two years. We've set up an insurance pool with our, our friends in the Indian government. We have Indian government uh, concluded the international convention, which would limit liability appropriately. Land has been designated for six nuclear reactors. Westinghouse has been identified as the company to produce those reactors. They've submitted a commercial offer last fall and our two leaders have set a deadline of this summer to sign the commercial contract. So we are well on our way to the largest civil nuclear deal ever concluded uh, to be right here in India producing well, can power. I, can I stop you there? Yeah. The question that many ask is does the Indian government need to take additional steps to address the concerns that American companies have with particular regard to India's nuclear liability law? And I'm talking specifically about section 46, which makes the supplier liable for tort claims. Yeah. This was meant to be resolved by an assurance from the Indian Attorney General by way of a memorandum. But my question is, has that proved to be inadequate? Because concerns in America about that particular section remain. Liability has not been our chief concern. And, and in fact, that breakthrough agreement, and it was a breakthrough agreement, has helped pave the way for this largest deal ever. Now we're down to the details of financing, cost of financing, so cost of power. Section 46 is not a concern with Westinghouse or with GE. Look, I don't want to speak on behalf of the companies. All I know is that Westinghouse has put forth a commercial offer. We're in the final stages, and I believe we will get there. And it'll create not only power here in, in India for 60 million, but it'll create jobs in both countries for both uh, I remember nations. an interview you gave to the Hindu in October, that's just about three months ago, and you said, I'm quoting you, I would like to see a shovel get into the ground. Absolutely. It hasn't happened. 
Well, and it doesn't look as if it's going to happen anytime soon. So do you leave a little disappointed by the progress? No. And in fact, uh, look, these, these commercial negotiations are multi-year uh, negotiations. So we're in the final stages of the commercial negotiation. And as I said, look back to the joint statement that the Prime Minister and President put out over the summer, last summer, we set June of 2017 as our target to com complete the commercial contract. I think we're on, we're on course. So let's see if we can get there. So you're saying to me that the concerns that have been expressed in the press about continuing lingering apprehensions about the nuclear liability law in India, particularly Section 46, do not apply, that they are not hindrances, that they're not holding back American companies. Remember, we've set up these additional mechanisms with our Indian partners. So the ratification of the treaty, the assurances from the Ministry of Justice, the insurance pool, now the terms and conditions in the commercial contract will all help to minimize the liability concerns that were once there. So yes, I am much more optimistic on the li liability question than where we were before. It doesn't mean the deal has been finalized, but we are moving in that pathway. And you expect a commercial contract by June 2017? That was the, that was the target we have set, and we are going to do everything in our power to make sure we can support the negotiations so that we can get there. Now, more broadly, I will say in, in the energy cooperation, we have also been big supporters of India's renewable target of 175 gigawatts, so, the largest single target. I, and those country. are not areas that are contentious, so I won't explore them further. Understood. I'll come to another area where people believe, in fact, that the progress has been a lot less than what was hoped for. Hmm. India's membership of the NSG. Sure. My first is a blunt question. Would you blame China for holding this up? Look, I think we have to take a step back, and I'll try to be brief as I explain this. But the president's commitment was about assuring that the international institutions and regimes of today represent India's interests. And what I mean by that is we have a country of 1.3 billion people, largest democracy on the planet. The president's view was that they should have a seat on a reformed UN Security Council, that they should be leading members of the G20 that they should be members of all the multilateral export control regimes. That includes the MTCR, of which they are now members. That includes the Australia Group and Vasanar Group, of which we are working very constructively with our Indian partners, and I believe membership will be possible. And that means NSG. But and it sounds to me as if you're suggesting that the President wasn't particularly emphatic about India joining the NSG. The Indian position is that we believe there was a firm commitment, there separate to all the other commitments, you're suggesting that something different. No, actually I'm suggesting actually something much more um, compelling, which is India playing a leading role on the global stage, and that includes NSG, the President, the Vice President, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, have all been working uh, very hard on India's membership in the Which NSG. I understand. And but it is, uh, within it is the NSG, just to focus on that, because you know it's a key issue of concern sure. in the media, would you say China is the problem? I think, I think uh, what we've been trying to do is work through the various objections of which China uh, has, has raised some concerns. These, in these multilateral discussions, you have to take your time and you have to work through individual countries' uh, concerns. And again, I am optimistic that the other countries will see the compelling nature of the case for India as we do today. We believe India when should be, we believe India should accede to the NSG today. Ah, the question is this. Many Indians say that perhaps President Obama didn't try hard enough. In 2008, when the waiver was being sought, then President Bush actually rang up then President Hu, and the matter was resolved. The impression and belief is President Obama didn't make a similar call this time around. Had he done so, maybe China's objections and reluctance would have disappeared. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a, a fair comparison, and I, I'm proud of the work that this administration and the president uh, have done, and I believe that the next administration will continue with this. And again, I think this is one we have to work through individual countries' concerns. We will continue to do that. Um, but I've seen uh, a really substantial and, and good effort and good partnership uh, between the U.S., India, and other strong supporters of India's membership. Do you have any sense of when India will become a member of the NSG, or is it pretty close to impossible to say? I, I don't want to put a timeline on it because it's a, it's a multilateral body that has its own, own schedule. 
but I can assure you that this will continue to remain a top tier issue for both countries. And you're therefore suggesting or actually saying that this will be an important concern for the incoming Trump yeah, administration. I can't, I, so I can't speak for the incoming administration, but when I look at all the kind of bilateral issues between us, I, I've got to believe this will continue to be right up there as one of the important objectives. Let me come to something that has happened very recently in an interview to PTI. Peter Leroy, a senior director at the National Security Council, spoke of concrete cooperation between India and America on terror. Mm -hmm. And he had a very interesting sentence there. He said, I can tell you quite definitively that due to our partnership, several terrorism plots were spoiled, Indian lives and American lives were saved, because of this partnership. Can you tell me more about this? Because this is new to everyone. No, I, look, I don't think the notion of intelligence cooperation and sharing of security information is new. And in fact, if anything, it's been deepened uh, over the last two years. And that's what we do. And that's what close partners do. Uh, but you have actually averted potential terror strikes and thus save so, lives on so, both sides. So what I'm not going to do is get into specific intelligence reports or specific information that was shared. I just want you and the viewers to know that we have deepened our intelligence cooperation, we have deepened our counterterrorism cooperation, and it is a huge part of our security relationship. I was proud to be able to uh, sign a new agreement on terror screening information, which we signed uh, last summer as well. That's reflective of the, of the kind of partnership we have. We've issued... So there's uh, complete trust on both sides on the issue of sharing information and intelligence. Look, that, this, is what we, this is what we do. This is what close partners do. And we will continue to do more of it because we have a collective interest in eliminating the scourge of terror wherever it occurs. And if you look at our counterterrorism declarations, you look at any of the joint statements between our two countries over the last two years, the counterterrorism effort has been a key part of any statement that our, our leaders have made. There's no doubt that counterterror plays a very major role in the joint statements the two sides put up, but there are concerns that Indian people continue to have, and they say, despite the effort America has tried to make to restrain the LET in Jaish in Pakistan, despite the fact that you put pressure on the Pakistani government, that terror not only continues, but it seems to increase. And many people feel Surely America can do more. And the question I'm asking is, can you do more? Have you been reluctant to do more? Why is it that this continues despite your best efforts? Look, this is one of our, our chief security threats of the day, confronting the United States, confronting India, confronting the people of Pakistan and the broader region, which is the threat and the scourge of terror. And no one nation can stop it on its own. This takes a collective response. This takes uh, law enforcement, intel, military economic tools, social tools, we're working all of that front. Now on the specific uh, regional issues, we've taken a very uh, tough line with the Pakistani government about the need to sh shut down safe havens, hold perpetrators accountable. We've been very tough on and had new restrictions. But why, why have you not been more successful? New restrictions put in on the Haqqani network, for example. We've had a new designations on LET and JEM. We've worked with our Indian colleagues at the, at the United Nations to, to try to put in additional sanctions on, on terrorist leaders. It's a very difficult problem, and we, this is, there's no actual greater priority for the, the U.S. security establishment than to ensure that we eliminate this scourge of terror. Can but, I put it, you a question that I imagine you must have heard as an ambassador from Indians many times? America plays a very active role with its drones, targeting the Haqqani group and the Taliban, both are based in Pakistan. Why can't you use the same drone technology to target LED and Jesh? Look, I'm not going to get into to specific targeting efforts. I just want to uh, let you know and let your viewers know, I don't think we would take a backseat to anyone on our effort to uh, go after terrorists wherever they may be, to lead uh, a global coalition against terrorists, whether it's the anti-ISIL coalition or whether it's our efforts across uh, the AFPAC region, and so we've been a, a provider uh, of security for millions of people, and that's, that's a role that the U.S. Uh, has taken and played a leadership role, and a lot of sacrifice and a lot of treasure has gone into that role. And yet and I suppose for Indians the 
paradox is that despite the best efforts you make to restrain and rein in LED and Jesh, to put pressure on the Pakistanis to control and curb them, it doesn't happen. And Pakistan is a very close ally of yours. Why is Pakistan able to defy you? Look, I think this is something we're all going to have to work on. Use all the tools in our toolbox, diplomatic, economic, political, and we'll continue to do that. You know, I think, I think that's, you, that's a commitment that, that we have, is, and, and it's for the benefit of people across the region. Sure. And, and so, so this is something we have to continue to work on. In this context, how do you view the surgical strikes India carried out in September and the possibility raised by the new army chief that they could happen again should the need arise. How do you view that? Yeah, look, I think obviously we would like to see uh, reduction in tensions and increased dialogue. And what we said at the time of the surgical strike is that we also understand the uh, Indian need to defend itself and its, and its people. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, w but, but everyone would benefit from reduced tension in that area and along the line of control in particular. Ambassador Varadkar, let's take a break at that point. So far we've talked about India-US relations, your achievements, your successes, as well as what I call the unfinished tasks that lie ahead. I want to now come back and talk to you about the huge transition that happens in America in 36 hours time when Donald Trump takes over as president. I want to talk to you about what it means for your country, what it means for India-US relations, and I want to raise with you some of the concerns Indians have about what a President Trump could mean for India. We'll be back in a moment's time for the second part of this exclusive interview. Welcome back to a very special episode of To The Point. My guest is the departing American Ambassador Richard Varma, and this is Ambassador Varma's first and only farewell interview on television. Now, Ambassador, as you know better than me, we're doing this interview at a time when there is a major transition about to take place in your country. Yes. 36 hours, Donald Trump will be president. And many people expect that that transition will bring about possibly unsettling changes in America's domestic politics, perhaps in international politics. Do you believe, within that context, Indo-U.S. relations are irreversible, or could they start to slide? Could we see retreats? I think we uh, leave this relationship to the new administration in very, very uh, solid footing. In fact, on a substantial upward trajectory, and I think some of the gains are, yes, in fact, irreversible. And and I just think about what we've done in the economic and and trade basket, because if the concern is about globalization and about trade and about uh, working with foreign partners, then I would submit to you, if you look at the U.S.-India economic partnership and strategic partnership, this has been a relationship that has worked and worked for both people of, of both of our nations, and it's created economic opportunity in both nations, and that's that, why... That's true, Ambassador of the past. But there are question marks about H-1B visas raised first by President Trump himself during the campaign and yeah. then more recently by his pick for Attorney General, Senator Sessions. And both have spoken about wanting to curb them. Now you know, as I do, that the H-1B visa is critical for India's information technology. Could this issue become a new flashpoint? Look, this isn't a new issue. I've, I've been working on this issue for two years. This issue has come up for many years. You remember out of, uh, out of the 1.1 million visas we issued last year, 70,000 were H-1Bs. So I think we have to also keep this in context. I also think it's important that we address the economic and political uh, concerns about the H-1B. So there has been some misuse of the H-1B. And I also think we have to be more attuned to the economic arguments that people are making in both countries. Now what I hear from the Indian side is that this will have a huge impact on the IT sector and, and we should uh, we understand that and appreciate it. But what I know, having grown up in Pennsylvania, in the Rust Belt, and, and what I've seen on the American side is that it does have an impact on the American workforce. I think there's a way uh, to solve this problem where you can have uh, American workers working alongside 
Indian skilled professionals uh, in a way that brings value to both countries and to the companies that are working on these issues. So we're going to have to sit down across the table and work on this issue. I'm not suggesting it's going to be easy, but I think to ignore it or to suggest it doesn't, you know, it's not a central issue um, would also be a mistake. So I, I think this is going to be something we're going to have to work on together. There are also reports in the media that President Trump, when he becomes President Trump, might seek to play a bigger, greater role in sorting out problems between India and Pakistan than any of his predecessors have done. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, when he was reporting on the conversation he had with Donald Trump, brought this up and mentioned it. And there are some reports that apparently the Vice President-elect, Mike Spence, has raised this in an NBC interview. Do you really believe the new administration would venture into this territory? Or would it shy away despite what it said? You know, all I can tell you is that long-standing American policy uh, has been to resolve uh, that these disputes between India and Pakistan should be resolved between India and Pakistan. And that the time in which it happens, the scope in which it happens, the manner in which it happens is to be sided between the two parties. And I, I would believe that would be a policy that continues, but I can't speak for the next oh, I fully understand yeah. you can't speak for the new incoming administration and you're making it clear that America's traditional policy is to leave India and Pakistan to sort out these problems themselves. But there are so many areas where Donald Trump as president-elect has ventured in effectively changing America's traditional position. China and the one China policy being one example. His comments about Russia and President Putin being another. His comments about who should go as the next British ambassador, which is something no one's ever said before as the president like is a third. And so many in India say, might venturing into Kashmir or into the relationship between India and Pakistan be a force? Is this something where he might tread? Or would you believe that the American system would advise him and constrain him? Look, I think we just talked about so much happening in our, in our U.S.-India relationship from strategic and economic issues, trade issues, where we've broken every record in our, in our partnership. And I think there's so much happening on that front. And uh, so I think there's enough to keep the new team focused on without a uh, fairly dramatic change in policy. So I, I, I frankly would be surprised if we saw a very major change. One other issue of concern to people in India are the comments Donald Trump made when he was campaigning about Muslims. He first spoke about keeping them out virtually altogether. Now he's talked about curbing the numbers that come into America. And as you know, India has a population of just over 170 million Muslims. This is an issue of concern to them. Do you believe Donald Trump as president would implement these proposals that he came up with when he was campaigning? Or do you think he'll quietly forget about them? Look, I, I can tell you about our experience in America and growing up in America as an immigrant family. and. I remember uh, my mother, uh, you know, not wearing American clothes, wearing traditional Indian clothes, cooking Indian food. She wasn't Christian, spoke with an accent. And I remember when my mother decided she wanted to be an American citizen. And she studied very hard for the test. She went down, uh, did her, and, and passed the test, had her swearing in, brought home her American flag. And it reminds me, and it should remind everyone, of what it actually means to be an American. She was a great American, and she was so proud of her Indian roots, and she retained her culture and her religion and her identity. And that is the promise of America. That's what we've built America on. And uh, that is uh, part of our fabric, part of our constitution, and part of our history that, that has drawn people to our country for 200 plus years, hundreds of millions of people. You're not saying it, but it's quite clear that is also what Donald Trump as president should keep in mind. Look, I think the, the issue of social justice and equality and inclusive constitutional democracies are values that we share. They run to the fiber of, of who we are and and, and those are just, those are the, the most important values that we have. We're coming to the end of this interview. Let me put this to you. We've had eight glorious years of smooth sailing. You described it as the rising trajectory under President Obama and perhaps eight similar years under his predecessor, President Bush. Yeah. Now there's a concern that there's a fairly changeable, volatile gentleman becoming the new president. Might the relationship that has been smooth sailing 
become a bit more volatile or certainly may the waters become more choppy? Look, I think we've gotten to a place, uh, particularly in our two capitals, where people understand the huge importance and value of this relationship on a bipartisan, I'd almost argue nonpartisan basis. We've got three and a half million Americans of Indian descent and South Asian descent in the United States that will continue to be a strong bridge and, and connecting force regardless of what happens on the, on the political level. We have these values that I mentioned that we share that will continue to draw us together, inclusive democratic societies uh, that, that pull us together. When we look out in the world today, we don't often see other countries that have subscribed to the same value system that both the United States and India have. So look, a and I just say we've demonstrated such progress and impact to ordinary people on the ground. So I just think this relationship is going to be in a different category. It is going to have a very special status, uh, not only in the next administration, but in the, in the administration after that. It doesn't mean we don't have to work on it. We have to tend to it. We have to continue to build trust. We have to continue to show our people that it makes a difference. And but it is strong enough to withstand whatever uncertainty comes under a President Trump. I think this relationship is strong, resilient, as the President says, the defining partnership of the 21st century, and as the Prime Minister says, I think we're natural allies. In which case, my last question. In 36 hours, President Obama will cease to be President of the United States. How will history remember the first black American president? Well, I think, I think he will be a historic president. And I think if you th think about when he came into office in the fall of 2008, uh, the great financial crisis, uh, turmoil across the Middle East, we had 200,000 troops in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, there was global uncertainty. He helped us weather that storm, helped have America lead uh, the way uh, in, in weathering not only the financial crisis, but also bringing some degree of stability and, and peace. He's been a great mo role model for hundreds of millions of people. His family have been amazing uh, public servants. He has restored our alliances. He has, has the most period of sustained job growth in American history. So do I think America, that history will look favorable upon the president? I, I really do. And I think he's been an uh, incredible uh, leader. And you're saying one thing more. You're saying America owes him a huge thank you. We all owe him a huge thank you. And um, he'll, be, he'll be remembered. I hope he stays active in, in public life because we need his voice uh, out there for years to come. Ambassador Varma, a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much.